If I own gold or silver, how will I ever be able to spend it? Oh, sure. Well, consider good times or bad times. Like in good times, you can sell it back to the same place you bought it from. SDBullion.com slash RP will buy it back at the best price guaranteed on the internet. You can take it to a local coin shop and get cash in your hand, completely anonymous. Some people you know may be willing to take gold or silver coins in exchange for goods or services. Now, in bad times, when things have really fallen apart, time after time in history, people have found that in hard times, Gold and silver really does come through as something that people recognize as value even after everything else has failed. Your first ounce of silver is at spot price and you get free shipping on any order over $99 at sdbullion.com slash rp. Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. Today we have a very special guest for you, Joel Salatin, a full-time farmer in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. He's a third-generation alternative farmer. He returned to farming full-time in 1982 and continued refining and adding to his parents' ideas. His farm services more than 5,000 families with 10 retail outlets and 50 restaurants, depending on them, through on-farm sales and metropolitan buying clubs for salad bar beef and pasteurized poultry, egg mobile eggs, piggerator pork, forage-based rabbits, pasteurized turkey, and forestry products also using relationship marketing. Joel has a degree in English and writes extensively in food magazines such as Stockman Grass Farmer, Acres USA, and Food Shed. And his family's farm, Polyface Incorporated, the farm of many faces, was featured in Smithsonian's Magazine, National Geographic, Gourmet Magazine, countless other radio, television, and print media. He's been profiled on the Lives of the 21st Century series with Peter Jennings on ABC World News. And his grass farm was featured on the New York Times bestseller Omnivore's Dilemma by food writer guru Michael Pollan and award-winning food documentary Food, Inc. Joel is also a sought-after conference speaker addressing a wide range of issues from creating your farm your children will want to making white-collar salary from a pleasant life in the country. And uh, from all the wide-ranging topics across a wide number of audiences that he speaks to, Joel is a revolutionary for common sense in a world gone mad. And his vortex of wisdom is rooted in his family's thriving farm in Virginia and a lifetime of learning, which also draws on generations of experience that he is benefiting from. So, Joel, we're very glad and privileged to have you here on Reluctant Preppers. Oh, I'm uh, thrilled and honored to be with you. Our focus often is on the individual family member, the individual homeowner, and what they can do to increase their family's self-reliance and resilience and reduce their dependency on fragile systems for supplying for, the, for their family's basic necessities. You have one of your talks called The Self-Contained Home, where you talk about how our, our homes typically require massive infusions of cash to maintain and energize and feed and keep us hydrated but how you can give us a new way of looking at that so that our homes become a source of producing more than they cost and uh, also appealing to those who want to be more reliant in their domestic living. So if we could explore some of your concepts for the self-contained home in this broadcast, uh, we'd love to have you share those thoughts with our audience. Well, sure. Well, thank you so much. And I, I guess I guess the, uh, the, the place to start is... Um, is with perhaps water. Water is, uh, you know, people that are on either a, a well or and septic or a public water where they're buying water and, you know, the water, the sewage is going into a, into a utility. Um, you know, a, a place to start is how to uh, reduce your, you know, your water use and reduce your sewage, and those all, of course, have impacts on the greater community, and of course, reduce uh, floodwaters and all that, that that creates stormwater issues and all that for the you know for the municipality, which is a you know a good thing to do for neighbors. Um, 
And so uh, I'm a big believer in, uh, for example, cisterns. You know, you can you can gutter your gutter your roof and get that water into a cistern. At least in states other than uh, California, uh, Colorado, and Western Oregon. I understand that uh, rain that uh, rain barrels are illegal, uh, at least in Colorado, and they've they they looks like they're going to become illegal in Western Oregon. Um, well, I'm sorry, East, Eastern Oregon, the dry part, which is, uh, of course, silly uh, because what we, the, the way to handle that, if people are looking for, a, you know, for an apologetic, how do you get, you know, through these things, is the, the simple question: How's the best way for humans to participate in rain, with raindrops? I mean, is, is there any participatory room for humans to interact with raindrops? And I suggest that there is. Uh, we can either encourage them to run downhill as fast as possible and, and get away from us, or we can encourage them to slow down and stay as close to where they drop for as long as possible so that they can be used through a labyrinth of multiple uses as they gradually trickle downhill. Now, it doesn't take a – you don't have to be a hydrologist or an agronomist or an ecologist, uh, you know, scientist to understand that it's a good thing to slow raindrops down in their gravitational move downhill. That it, that it, it, it hydrates, it ultimately hydrates the whole system to hold raindrops up high. And so, so, um, so you know, guttering the roof, going to a cistern approach, uh, using your water, and then, and then you simply replumb a little bit of your plumbing so that you don't put potable water in a toilet, and now you can stop your sewage by your water consumption and your sewage, you know, by 50%. You know, those are huge, huge savings, and kind of, you know, speaks to the whole uh, need of water. Still on the topic of water, the capturing rainwater into a cistern for reuse, such as gray water for flushing toilets or that sort of use in the home or for watering uh, small gardens, that sort of thing. Um, but beyond that, what are your thoughts on people's over-dependence on municipal water supply and the water quality? Just this a week ago, we had a major uh, national news story came out about the greater Toledo area in Ohio where there was a contamination of from a agricultural and other uh, runoff into Lake Erie causing huge algae blooms which caused uh, microtoxin to be developed that then contaminated the Toledo greater Toledo water supply and, and 500,000 people affected where they didn't have a reliable source to fall back on. So for a homeowner who wants to reduce their fragility of their dependence on that, besides the obvious of just storing uh, some cache of bottled water or, or barrels of water, something like that. Are there other considerations that people should look to in terms of either wells or purification systems that they should have for their home? Well, yes. Uh, I mean, yeah, look, one of the reasons that I'm such a fan of cisterns, A, they're, his, they're historically, uh, I mean, throughout the eons of civilization, they are perhaps the single most um, you know, common way to store water. It was easier. It was easier to get water into a cistern, for example, than to dig a well. Uh, and, and without and without pipes, uh, without you know, back before the days of, of uh, cheap piping, um, you know, on-site cisterns allowed water to be stored that you could actually see. And one of the problems with wells is that you can't see down there. There can be pollution you don't see and happens before you realize it. Uh, the well can go dry in a drought and you don't realize that the aquifer is, is going down until suddenly you have muddy water and you have and, and when you have muddy water you're you're suddenly now you're in trouble. Uh, but 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 so are other people. So they're all calling well drillers to come out and you know and and dig a new well, and suddenly you're you know you're 12 months out. So uh, so I'm a huge believer in um, in water, what I call water redundancy. Interestingly, when you go, if you, if you ever travel to, for example, Australia, which of course is you know it's a dry continent, but I mean even in the middle of Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane, you know the great great big cities. Every single house has five to twenty thousand gallon cisterns. Uh, many of them are hidden by bushes, or they got vines growing up over them to keep them, you know, cool and hidden. 
but every single house has it, and it's amazing how much water comes off of a roof. Uh, you know, in, in a in a 31 inch rainfall area, um, roughly 20 gallons of water per year is collected on every square foot. You know, we just we just built um, a new intern housing, and uh, we put in a 15,000 gallon cistern. And uh, and you wouldn't believe the water that gushes off that you know off that roof. Um, the, the, most of the times, the problem is not that an area doesn't get enough rain. The problem is that it doesn't hold the rain on rain events when they come. And so, if you if you can hold those, that's why that's why I like to talk about raindrops. If you can hold those raindrops uh, near where they fall. You can use them a lot of times. In, in now rural America, I don't know how many of your listeners are in actually rural America, but uh, you know, with fracking and, and, and pesticide, herbicide, and, and things like that going on, there again, there are things going on in the aquifers that, that are very hard to discern. And so, um, and so, so cisterns uh, are are big. And, and, and I, I promote cisterns. I'd like to see a, a cistern economy. I mean, I go to Australia. Seems like a couple times a year, um, and and cisterns there are a quarter of the cost. It costs a quarter of, of the of the um, price to store a gallon of water in Australia as it does in the U.S. Why? Because we simply don't have a thriving cistern industry. If we had a thriving cistern industry in this country, uh, the prices the price for cisterns would be as low as it is in Australia which is roughly a quarter the price that it is here. It's fascinating. So note to our listeners, uh, as Fabian Calvo mentioned about find your passion and, and find other streams of income, as uh, as Jerry Robinson also points out, uh, there's a there's a clue from from uh, our cur- current guest, Joel Salatin, that there's a need for a cistern industry in the United States. So if that uh, sparks your interest, look into it, and there's a, there's a niche there. <laughs> Yeah, there, there you go. I mean, I mean, uh, how many people are scared about water quality with pipelines and fracking and all this stuff going on? Uh, I mean, this is this is a perfect, perfect um, solution to that kind of vulnerability. It, it's not a vulnerability to quantity; it's a vulnerability to quality. And also, even with uh, rainwater captured into a cistern, there could be atmospheric pollutants that would be of concern. But you had sp- you had mentioned possible uses for that water that might be less sensitive, such as separated into a separate non-potable system to reduce your other home use of drinking water. Absolutely. I mean, most of the water that we use in the home, goodness, I don't know what the percentage is, but uh, certainly, you know, 98% of the water we use in the home doesn't have to be potable. I mean, actually drinkable. I mean, you can actually shower in in water. You can certainly, you know, poop in the water. Uh, and, and you can wash clothes in water that's, that's, that, that you wouldn't might not want to drink, but it's, but it's, it's certainly uh, okay for that. When it comes to purifying water, do you have any recommendations? Well, sure. There are all sorts of everything from, you know, glorified swimming pool filters through sand filters. Uh, on our well, for example, we have a UV filter. Um, there's uh, on the hunt camp where we put in a great big, uh, the, where the, the interns that we call it the hunt camp, they're hunting for the truth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have a, we have a flush system, so your your gutter comes down, and instead of going directly into the cistern, uh, what's called the first flow of water, and it might have some twigs or bird poop or whatever on it, you know that goes into a to a uh, it, it, the gutter comes into a T and flows into this you know this column, this like six inch PVC column that has a little hole in the bottom of it. It gushes in there, takes that first, you know, like 20 gallons off the roof, and then when it fills up, then the water flows over the top uh, and down into the into the cistern. And then between rain events, this you know little uh, this this kind of ballast slowly drains out into a you know into a garden or a raised bed or something. You know, you want to use that water too, and um, and then you know and then it's clean for the next uh, for the next rain event. So yeah. Well, turning our attention from water to food, what are your recommendations for people wanting to increase their self-reliance and resilience on on producing food or having more options for their food supply? Well, I 
think number one, especially if you're if you're uh, anywhere north of what Florida, mid Mississippi, uh, Houston, Texas, which is you know most of north of most of the U.S. Um, if you're north, if you have any cold at all in the winter, uh, if you're using any heat, any you know petroleum type heat or wood or whatever heat in the winter. Um, the first thing is to put a solarium on the side of your house. Well, you say, well, what does that have to do with food? Well, the beauty of a solarium is that it allows you to get passive solar heat to heat your house, and it gives you a place to grow vegetables in the wintertime. And, and, of course, you can grow vegetables in there in the summertime as well. So when you ta start talking about greatest marginal reaction, greatest kick for the, kick for the effort, a solarium is absolutely uh, one of the hottest bangs for the buck in the whole deal because it combines passive solar energy gain with off-season food production. And, you know, in my opinion, every single home, every single building uh, in North America, north of what I mentioned, um, should have a solarium on it. For that reason, I mean, think of the petroleum that's used. If all the petroleum that's used right now to truck lettuce and uh, and spinach and Swiss chard from California and Florida to Maine and Minnesota and Indiana and Ohio in the wintertime were put instead into plastic and Lexan. Uh, for for solariums on the side of our buildings in these northern areas, not only could we shut the trucks down, we wouldn't need the trucks, we wouldn't need that petroleum, we wouldn't need the highways, but we would have instead taken this bonanza of petroleum and instead of creating a, a 2,000 mile fragile uh, uh, petroleum dependent food system, instead we would be leaving a legacy for our grandchildren of on-site, real-time energy and food independence. You know, it, it, it's, it's not like it's a sin to use petroleum. What it's a sin to do is to squander this blessing on, on something that creates more dependency and fragility instead, <laughs> instead of investing it in something that creates more resiliency and, uh, and, and you know, less petroleum use. Addition, additional thoughts on food production. Yeah. That's one area of specialty for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, solariums are certainly, you know, my number one thing. I mean, we have a house that was built in 1780, and it has a state-of-the-art cedar-built solarium on the side of it. It's beautiful. It looks beautiful. It's wonderful. And, you know, and this is a retrofit on a 250-year-old house, okay? So, so it can be done uh, anytime, anywhere today. Uh, right now, um, and they're not that expensive. I mean, and get a, you know, don't be afraid to get a good one. I mean, ours cost a little, but uh, they're just they're they're so they're so valuable. Um, secondly, you know, you, if you have any yard at all, front yard, backyard, whatever, uh, edible landscaping. I mean, from nut and fruit trees to uh, raised beds to whatever. Uh, the, the the idea is to instead of having a lawnmower turn your whatever space you have into productive capacity. Any suggestions for people who, like us, are dealing with uh, deed restrictions from their homeowners association that outlaw gardening? Yeah, move. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I wish I had an answer for it, but I mean, I had a lady in Texas that had to pay a fine to her homeowners association because they had a prohibition on farming, and she had the unmitigated gall to grow two tomato plants in her flower bed and had to pay a fine because she was farming. You know, that's that's I, I, that's unspeakable. You know, I, I can't. I don't have words to describe how asinine, ludicrous. You know, you know I could go down to thesaurus, but but it, it's obscene. It's obscene that we have that kind of snobbish elitism in these homeowners associations that they would outlaw. You know, uh, uh, clotheslines, the ultimate solar dryer, and uh, then that they would outlaw vegetable gardens and things like that. I, I, you know, I know that there's a sense that they're they're dirty, but um, I guess I guess uh, you know, if, if you can't if you can't make a case for the to the homeowners association, get the rules changed, then 
I guess I put the house on the market and try to move somewhere. I mean, you know, sometimes, sometimes that you know that that becomes the best option is just um, going to a different place that's that's easier to become. Some places are very hard to become self reliant in. They just are, and um, and so sometimes you have to just you have to just move. Um, now that being that being said, think about the things that you can do incognito. Um, for example, uh, you know there are now. I'm sure you're familiar with aquaponics. Uh, I'm a I'm just a huge fan of of aquaponics. Not aquaponics that that are hydroponic, but aquaponics that use a pebble medium at least, so that so that the so that the medium, the, the growing medium, uh, actually can have surface area to, to, you know, get bacteria and fungi and things like that on it to more approximate a soil system. Um, but you know, there are there are home aquaponic systems now. Turnkey, you get a kit, and the thing you know will produce all of the letter, all of the greens that you need. Not you know all your not all your green beans and things like that, but at least all of your salad greens. Uh, for a family of four, and uh, and enough fish to have fish, you know, once a month, uh, in a footprint no bigger than a refrigerator. So you know, rip out the TV, tear out the entertainment center, and um, and and put in your little aquaponic system. Uh, you know, you don't have to ask, you don't have to tell, uh, nobody has to see it, and it's in your home. You know, uh, you, you can. Another my favorite is uh, get rid of the dog, the cat, the gerbil, and the hamster, and the parakeet, and, and put in uh, a couple of chickens. Uh, that can be done in your house, in a, in a condominium. Uh, they're they're uh, very enjoyable, and they eat all your kitchen scraps. Instead of sending your kitchen scraps out to the uh, curb for the garbage guys to pick up and take to the landfill, um, just feed them to the chickens, and the chickens give you eggs, and now you have eggs. You don't have to buy eggs, and you don't have to throw away the trash. I mean, 75% of everything that goes in the landfills in the U.S. is decomposable biomass. You know, that's, that, that, that's, it's evil, you know, it's, it's immoral it's to, to take what, to take this uh, biomass, you know, solar energy, whether it's a, a cucumber peel or, a, or a, a, a junk piece of furniture, a chair or something, um, but to take that decomposable biomass and send it to the landfill where it's going to last for, who knows, you know, millennia. Um, it is, is, is just it is a, it is an assault on the beautiful uh, carbon centric solar solar to biomass to life to to death to decomposition solar to biomass you know it, it it's an assault to that that uh, cycle that's supposed to be occurring. So are you advocating uh, composting as well then? Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, you can get little uh, earthworm, red wiggler vermicomposting bins that go under your sink, um, composting on site, you know, pot gardens. And everybody laughs when I say pot gardens. And, yes, I, I'm fine if you want to grow pot too. But, you know, uh, container gardens like, you know, in, in pots on your, on your patio, uh, you'd be surprised. If you go to, for example, a Mother Earth news uh, fair. They now have four of them uh, around the country. Uh, next one's coming up in uh, Pennsylvania. If you go to Mother Earth news fair, you will see, uh, you know, numerous, you know, people who sell urban urban patio gardening kits. They're stackable. Um, uh, some use uh, some use uh, packed compost, but what they, they, they look like little uh, you know Japanese uh, pagodas. You know they, they stack up, and and uh, you, you know you can drip some drip some water in the top, drip drip drip. You know and and uh, out of the out of the edges of all the pagodas, stacked pagodas. You know are your plants. And the roots extend down into the middle, you know, the column that's packed with, you know, some compost and soil and, and perlite or whatever. And, um, and, and, you know, on a, literally a corner of a patio, you know, you can grow, you know, 50 plants uh, that are, you know, 10 feet tall. Uh, the, 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 tie, the, the, the creativity in this 
kind of urban farming infrastructure now is just out of this world. Uh, and and so you know we need to you know we need to jump on that. So don't don't think that because you know, I live in an apartment condo or whatever uh, that you know that I can't you know, I can't be a part of this. And and, and you know um, I think too part of that self-contained home part of that idea is when we talk about food this may be something that a lot of people don't think about. But but some of it too is reestablishing a larder. You know we don't use that word anymore. Larder is kind of a, you know, something you read in Little House on the Prairie books and things like that. But a larder was essentially a, a, a huge pantry for storing foodstuffs. And um, it used to be what you know 80 years ago. If I went to your city and said, "Where's the food in this city?" It would all be in everybody's domestic larder, in their in their pantries, in their kitchens. It'd be be potatoes and carrots and canned goods and lacto fermented and pickles and sauerkraut crocks and all sorts of cool stuff. Today, if people don't go to the supermarket at least three times a week, you know, there's nothing to eat. The food is stored in a in a Costco warehouse 2,000 miles away. That is a very very fragile system that depends on you know, it depends on world peace. It depends on uh, all the parts of the distribution chain being in harmony. You know that all the teamsters are happy and the dock workers are happy and the. <laughs> The petroleum suppliers are happy, and the refrigeration mechanics are happy. And there's a free-flowing financial markets with credit being available to everybody along the way. That's right. And, and you know, you don't have to be a huge student of history to know that times of, distru- of disruption um, are, are generally uh, – there, there's many of them that are non-ecological, that are strictly social and economic – uh, as they are have anything to do with with ecology, so um, so even in you know even in good times uh, things are things can be pretty fragile, vulnerable. But if you if you use your house, if you buy in volume, buy in bulk, and you use your home as your food warehouse, that fundamentally changes not only the cost of what you're buying, because now you can buy it for half price because you're buying it unprocessed and in, you know, in season, but you're also in charge of all of the parts in the, in the chain that people have that become very concerned about. Uh, you know, why is it that half the stuff you buy in the store, even you know, just um, anything ready to eat, has uh, high fructose corn syrup, MSG, stabilizers, dyes, preservatives, uh, uh, you know, taste enhancers, all this stuff. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be. And when you have uh, preserved by, you know, by dehydration or canning or lacto fermenting, uh, whole foods, you know, real where you buy, where you get actual cucumbers, you know, from a farmer that you know, or you, you know, you can, for example, uh, chicken or beef or pork from a farmer that you know, and your and your larder is stacked with all these uh, cans of, of anything from venison to pork to chicken to whatever. Um, that is that is shelf stable for years and years. You know exactly where it came from, what went into it, and then think about this: when you lie down with your beloved at night, now. You don't have to worry about where tomorrow's meal is coming from. You don't have to worry about uh, what did some nameless, faceless person do in some, you know, huge processing factory tomorrow's, you know, tomorrow's dinner. What what drug residues are in there? You don't have to worry about that. Instead, instead, you're lying down proximate to this this wonderful cornucopia of food. That you've participated uh, in in acquiring and, and preparing, preserving, packaging, and it, it it 
it becomes a you know a, a bomb for your emotions for your I mean it becomes a spiritual thing that you you, you don't have to fear now you you know you can go forward in faith yes we've got this larder full of food here uh, things can collapse for you know six months and we're going to eat just fine and, and uh, you know when Teresa sends me shopping uh, I don't go to the supermarket I take a list down to the basement where she's got hundreds and hundreds of of, of uh, prepared you know canned stuff and uh, and pickles and and sauerkraut and whatever else and um, you know oh okay here's the list you know and I, I bring up you know green beans and applesauce and and pickled beets and sauerkraut and whatever and that's the way I go shopping and so when there's a snowstorm or there's a power failure or whatever it it, it doesn't doesn't bat an eye we just you know we just go to the basement and keep eating. Hey, Reluctant Preppers, if you haven't heard, we've already started our monthly one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle thank you gift to one active Patreon subscriber each month, signed by your host, Dunnigan Kaiser. And you don't want to miss out on that. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctantpreppers.